How are we doing, Bill? Just great. How are you? Good. And where are you situated now? I'm in Vermont, uh, in, in Addison County, um, where it's quite beautiful right at the moment. Good, good. What about you? Uh, I'm at my home in Watertown. Uh, if I look out the window, I can see uh, your old stomping grounds at Harvard. There you go. <laughs> uh, can I ask you some questions? Yes, fire away. Well, first of all, let me tell you what I'm doing. Uh, in my uh, old, old age, I'm, I've become fascinated anew with, with grassroots, uh, particularly in the churches. And uh, I know that you are uh, in touch in a whole variety of ways with grassroots. And I've just worked my way through your last book. So I have a bunch of questions I want to Fantastic. Ask. Let's okay. do it. Um, brace yourself. First, I want to ask you um, how you became you. In other words, uh, you know, you grew up in Lexington, you went to Harvard, you became editor of the Crimson, you went to New Yorker. Well, a, a number of people could do that and end up quite differently. But you had this kind of uh, uh, passion, this uh, identification of uh, justice issues and, and ecology issues. And, and I'm wondering sort of what is sort of the internal um, set of visions that may have prompted you in this specific direction? Well, of course, I grew up in Lexington, which has a particular history. And I was a tour guide on the green in my youth, telling the story over and over and over again of the brave Minutemen standing up to the redcoats and so on. And so I think that a uh, tendency to uh, stick by the underdog uh, may have come by uh -huh. naturally. Uh -huh. And I, you know, and that was probably reinforced by, um, uh, you know, the my, uh, by the church where I was there, also on the battle green in Lexington, um, uh, good liberal, Protestant congregational church that inculcated in me, I think, uh, the idea that the um, gospels as well were about standing up for the underdog. So. Perhaps yeah. not completely surprising that, makes, that I ended up. That makes good out. sense. I mean, uh, reading your book uh, about your history in Lexington and so forth, that fits in well. Uh, tell me something about uh, the influences on your life, like college teachers or maybe intellectual heroes, uh, Thoreau. Or, when you got to school, what? Well, who, who? Who did you work with? Well, so I had many, many important influences in my uh, intellectual life, probably beginning in high school, uh, where I had a wonderful history teacher and uh, debate coach, a man named Ray Karras, uh, uh -huh. who was extremely uh, rigorous and, and a very systematic and careful thinker. And he taught me the kind of habits of mind, how to outline an argument that I continue to use to this day. Um, so extremely grateful for that. Um, and then when you got to Harvard? Well, when I was at Harvard, while well, I was a very poor student, because uh, I spent all my time <laughs> working at the Crimson, um, <laughs> which was came out six days a week, so it could absorb an extraordinary amount of effort, which I was happy to give. And it was entirely student run, but the, you know, the older students there were great teachers. And, um, and so I, and, and I was just writing so much uh, that I became very comfortable in front of a typewriter. The blank sheet of paper held no terrors. And, um, and then I went on to the New Yorker where William Shawn, uh, Mr. Shawn, the great editor of the 20th century became my uh, dear friend, and again, uh, whom I learned a lot. Um, now although... you didn't you didn't go the academic route. You could have. I mean, you're good at scholarship. Uh... Uh, you know, I I I I had no interest in <laughs> going on to graduate school. Uh, the New Yorker was its own kind of graduate school for writing, yeah. um, and I had a reporter's curiosity, so omnivorous and wide ranging. I, the other person who was there that really uh, I, I worked with daily and became dear friends with and was a huge influence 
was Jonathan Schell, um, uh -huh. uh, who wrote the best book about Vietnam, the best book about Watergate, and then the most important book in some ways there ever was about the nuclear weapons, the fate of the earth. So, um, so these were great teachers, and I was lucky to have them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, um... And I'll add, while I was in New York, too, uh, I had the great good fortune to be a, a member at Riverside Church while William Sloan Coffin was in uh, the pulpit there. And so I'd had, between Peter Gomes at Harvard and Bill Coffin in New York, two of the last great preachers of that uh, uh, liberal mainline tradition. So no, they were great you, teachers as well. No, you, as I recall, you didn't mention uh, Bill Coffin in your book, The Flag, The Cross of the Station. Wagon. No, I didn't get to, I didn't quite get to New York hardly in, the, <laughs> in that book, but I've certainly written about him in the past and he, he we became great friends, um, a wonderful man. You know, I, I told me a story one time that I said, uh, I said, Bill, it's like you just, you never look at your manuscript. You never look at your notes. You just, this sort of pastor to pastor kind of conversation, you know, how, how do you do it? It's so fluid. He said, uh, I have it all memorized. He said, <laughs> he worked was, very hard. He had that kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of mind. Um, I, Yes, he was. He, I remember coming. I used to come in once in a while because I ran the food pantry and a homeless shelter at the church. So I was there at odd hours. And every once in a while, I'd come across him uh, playing the wonderful uh, organ uh, at Riverside, uh, which yeah. he was also capable of doing. So you you were uh, uh, you, you couldn't get away from the church. Not that you wanted to. You just happened to be there when you grew up and Lexington, and uh, you had this good experience at Memorial Church and that uh, uh, preaching uh, in New York. Yes, and then I moved out to the um, to very far out into the countryside to uh, the Adirondack Mountains, which was the great is, is the great wilderness of the American East, and was living in a town of two or three hundred people, but the Methodist Church there, and that was Methodist was the only brand on offer. Um, uh, there was a young preacher named Barb Lemmel, who was every bit as good as Peter Gomes or Bill Coffin. And uh -huh. uh, so I had another 10 years of fantastic sermons there. So I, I've been, um, I've been blessed over the years. And it's good more than most that. people, I think. Uh, Mention the Adirondacks makes me think of your book on Job. Mm. Uh, wilderness and the, uh, that sort of sticks out uh, your other writings. How did you happen to to write that book and wilderness and all that kind of thing? Well, I, I you know, I'd start, I started. I actually referenced and started thinking about Job in in the end of Nature, my first book, because um, I thought it was important and apropos. And I'd read my wife had given me sort of by chance, Stephen Mitchell's wonderful translation of Job from North Point Press, mm -hmm. uh, a truly magnificent translation by a truly magnificent translator. And so it had really, you know, brought to life a book that's actually, it's in its first 37 chapters, pretty hard to get through um, before it blossoms into this remarkable discourse uh, at the end. Um, but then uh, I, 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 United Theological Seminary in Dayton asked me to come give their annual three-part lecture. And so I used it as an opportunity to sort of dig much more deeply into Job. And the book is sort of the, um, uh, draws heavily from those talks that I gave in Ohio back then. And do you, do you still find that uh... Job speaks to you today. I mean, yes, it certainly does. Uh, I think about it very regularly. Um, uh -huh. That you know, uh, you know better than me. I, but I, it seems to me that that speech by God at the end of Job, I think, is the longest soliloquy that God delivers anywhere in the Bible, Old Testament or New. And it always seems the most 
daring, remarkable, modern um, uh, piece of writing in the entire Bible. So yes, I think of it often. Yeah, think, thinking of wilderness, um, did you go through um, uh, Perry Miller and all those people at Harvard uh, looking into wilderness as a theme? And Of and, course, uh, yes, America? yes. <laughs> yes, and, and all their updated counterparts, people like Bill Cronin at uh, Madison. And, uh -huh. so on. and, yeah. and uh, does, does wilderness uh, emerge in your own thinking now about what you're about? I mean, not sure. just wilderness is a problem, but wilderness is maybe something that moves you or inspires you. Of course, I, I'm very lucky to have lived my whole life, <clears throat> almost my whole adult life on the edge of big wilderness in the Adirondacks uh -huh. or in Vermont. And those are, that's very important to me. I mean, the burden of the end of nature was that there's really no such thing as actual wild wilderness anymore, not in a world where we're changing the temperature, but the desolation of the world we're creating makes relative wilderness all the more attractive and powerful as an uh -huh. idea. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um. Let me shift gears a, a little now and quote you to yourself um, about some public issues. Uh, this is from your book is what I'm trying to say is my life, the life of other people like me was built in a very real part on the suffering of others. That's not wokeness. That's not critical race theory. I love this. That's history. And in fact, to some extent, we've stopped that we stop doing these things doesn't mean uh, that we need to ignore the effects of earlier actions. And so here's my question. You're, if I may say so, an aging white guy um, who lives relatively comfortably in the US. How, how do you handle that? Well, I mean, there's no getting around to any of us are or where we came from or things. But the question is, what does one <clears throat> do with it? Um, uh, what things does one spend one's time and energy working on? Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, I spend my time and energy as a volunteer working to build big organizations that try and do what we can to tackle these kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So 350.org took as its mandate to work all over the world uh, on on climate justice. And, you know, we've organized demonstrations in every country on Earth except North Korea. Um, and now at Third Act, we're working on climate justice, but also on racial justice and voting and voting rights and voting suppression. and doing our best to organize people over the age of 60 to uh, uh, work on precisely these issues. And with good success so far, it's still near the beginning, but it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I was curious about that because uh, I don't want to stereotype old people or anything, but uh, uh, it's a, it may be, a, it, it seems to be a tough act uh, to reach out to people who are set in their ways uh, yeah, maybe. I know. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom is that people become more conservative as they age. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's some evidence to back that up. People have more to protect, perhaps. But these people who are in their 60s or 70s or 80s now, now all have a particularly um, interesting historical DNA. I mean, if you're in those ages now, it meant that in your first act when you were young, you were around to participate in, or at least to bear witness to, remarkable, epic, social, cultural, political transformation. And that, um, that DNA, I think, remains in people. Um, they were there when women were first taken seriously in our political life, when uh, we passed the Voting Rights Act at the Earth, first Earth Day in 1970, when 20 million Americans went in the streets, um, you know, on and on and on and on. Uh, 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 in fact, you can tell how important those years were because all those wretched Supreme Court decisions of recent months right. have focused on things that happened back then. Yeah. Uh, someplace between the Voting Rights Act of 65 
you know, the Clean Air Act of 1971 and Roe v. Wade in 73. So I think, we, you know, it's true that in our second act, we may have been as a generation more concerned with consumerism than with citizenship. But that water is under the bridge. And now it's time for people in their third act to draw on a lifetime of skills, on real resources, on the fact that they have some time, and on the fact that most of us have kids and grandkids. And so this abstract concept of legacy becomes much more concrete and real. So those are the things I think that are bringing people in to do mm -hmm. this work. Mm -hmm. uh, this implies something that you have uh, latched on to for your whole public life. Uh, uh, that is hope. And one of, the, one of the questions when I was a practicing pastor and still uh, it comes up in conversations uh, um, uh, I, you know, I grew up on Jürgen Moltmann, the theology of hope and things like this. And uh, so it's part of my business. I'm supposed to be hopeful. You know, I sort of, that's the shtick that goes with being a, a, a pastor. But I like to ask people who are facing real tough issues, you know, you, you get up the next day, you know, you, you're, you, you, at least publicly, you have sustained your hope for a long time. And, and I know that's not easy. How, how do you do it? Well, I'm not always hopeful. And, uh, you know, I'm quite a realist. The name of the first book that I wrote about all of this, I mean, it had the cheerful title, The End of Nature. So I'm right. not a Pollyanna. Um, but I've been blessed to watch these movements grow and grow. And so I know that there are now millions of people engaged in this work. That gives me hope. It's been a privilege to watch scientists and engineers at work figuring out how to do things like harness the power of the sun. Uh, that's quite, you know, that's, it's almost water into wine miracle that mm -hmm. the cheapest way to generate power on planet Earth right now is to point a sheet of glass at the sun, you know. Um, so that gives me hope. And, and just, you know, the fact that I'm outside for a little while every day in a extremely beautiful world keeps me on an even keel anyway. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How, how do you, uh, I don't want to pry too much, but how do you handle times of depression? I mean, it, um, which are, there are plenty of things to be depressed about, right? I tend to, uh, I, I mean, I'm lucky I've got a good family and all that, but, but uh, I tend to um, work harder. Um, I find that action is a reasonable antidote to despair in, uh -huh. uh, on mm -hmm. these topics. I, I wonder how, how, how you can mentor that. Uh, that uh, I mean, you do what you do, and you set an example, and that's really impressive. And lots of us are very grateful for you and for your, I consider it ministry, your public ministry. Um, but I guess uh, have have you thought of of of? I'm sure you have mentoring relationships. Have you had those kinds of things up over the years? Well, not. So formally, perhaps, but I mean, I founded 350.org with seven college students, and all of them are still active in this work a decade later and have gone on to do remarkable things. Uh -huh. So I was very grateful for the chance to get to, you know, work with them and help influence them early on. And, I, you know, I, I, I've known thousands and thousands of people, especially younger people, because that's mostly who's doing this work. And, and it's been great fun to get to work with all of them and and go on a little bit. Um, but mostly my job is to try and provide frameworks, organizations, campaigns that mm -hmm. allow people to bring their best self forward. Um, back to Lexington. Um, you grew up in a pretty conventional place, as you describe it. <laughs> yes. And Paul, uh, well, I was so con I mean, I was so middle American that I literally lived on a street called Middle Street. Yeah. 
<laughs> and and you did those the tours on Lexington Green, everything that was a hundred percent, maybe one hundred and fifty percent American. Uh, and I, as I from the outside and follow your vocational trajectory, I've seen you uh, probably uh, getting spiritual sustenance from people you've walked the lines with, uh, pipelines and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you still, uh, you, you write a column for a progressive evangelical magazine, Sojourners, and you see, it's, that seems to be really comfortable for you. Uh, and so I'm wondering, um, although you have this uh, broad range of really enlivening experience where you get inspired by people, uh, I wonder how whether you can, how do, how do they say it? Uh, you can take the boy out of Methodism, but you can't take Methodism out of the boy. That you, uh, tell me a little more about uh, your faith in so far as you're aware. Well, you know, I, it's when I was a very young boy, I was baptized Presbyterian. Uh -huh. um, then we moved, in fact, then we moved to Canada uh, for my mostly my elementary school years. And so there we were, of course, belonged to the United Church of Canada, which Canada had the wise idea of having one mainstream Protestant denomination right. <laughs> everybody could work on instead of having four churches on four corners. Um, then we moved to Lexington and I was confirmed into the United Church of Christ, Congregational Church. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved to the sticks, Methodism was what was on offer, you know. Um, and but at this point, they're all. I mean, at some point in the 19th or early 20th century, I think there were big differences between being a Presbyterian and being a Methodist and things. Right. Right. Truthfully, right. I don't think there's any difference at all anymore. Not um, too much. They're no. all just basically the same thing, um, which is, you know, uh, churches and religious tradition that's still engaged in the project uh, uh, of, of trying to build, you know, uh, what Dr. King called the beloved community, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to what strikes me as the evangelical project of a much more individualized, personal and transactional relationship with uh, 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 God. And I, so I think what happened in our religious life mirrored in many ways what happened in our political life uh, as Ronald Reagan came to the fore and and we really entered into an every man for himself kind of political world. Uh, I think we saw its echoes in the spiritual world as well. Um, so I'm I'm glad that those uh, traditions hang on, even if in uh, diminished form. And I think if one's looking for silver linings, you know, it's possible that the church is better set out to be the counterculture than the culture anyway. Um, and so I, 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 I don't weep too hard for the lost days of uh, the mainline ascendants. Um, I'm glad I grew up in it and was nurtured by it, and, um, but eager for the adventures ahead. Uh, as, as you look to the uh, future now, I mean, you've, you've started uh, a couple of massive organizations and uh, now this now th third act. Um, uh, I I'm just being signaled that I want to conclude now, <laughs> but let me conclude with this one. Five minutes, okay. Um, that what do you see that the, that the churches can do, uh, maybe that they're not doing now uh, in, in a way, whether it's shaping congregations or individuals, um, if, if you could sort of write out a prescription for uh, the church in the next 25 years, what sort of things would cross your mind? Well, I think that the churches need to, in, in their kind of relations with the larger world and their kind of political mission, need to adjust to the fact that they aren't the um, powers that once they were. Mm -hmm. And and 
I think they need to oddly to become more um, more um, Christian in their uh, uh, political work. I'm forever telling denominational leaders and things that we don't really need another position statement from you on climate change. Uh, the scientists have done a good job of that. Uh, we need you to explain and to act, you know, in the ways that that uh, the Gospels indicate we need to act, which is with radical, radical compassion uh, and standing up for the underdog um, at, at all times and and with more passion than we've shown so far. So I, I think we see great signs of that in places, but obviously we need more of it. Um, now, third act has a... Uh... A theology section or a religion a section. Faith, a faith working group, absolutely right. And, and many retired pastors. Hope? And <laughs> my hope is that they're going to be a clarion call for uh, 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 people of all faith backgrounds uh, to realize that that there's a great deal of joy to be had in um, moving out um, um, powerfully, um, in not pulling any punches. One of the good things about being old is, uh, you know what the hell you got to lose um, <laughs> you might as well just say it say it straight out and work on it and whatever else so i think we're gonna have a good time all right and i'm very uh, grateful that you're involved <laughs> in all of this paul and well thank I'm you very so grateful much for this chance to talk what a yeah, pleasure wonderful so thank um, you for this youtube ministry it's a good thing to be doing okay i'm working on it thanks again bill mckibben all right god bless Bye now and thanks god to your bless. whole crew <laughs>